Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the diverse lands in which we all come from. I'm speaking from Wellington, Aotearoa, and I acknowledge the leaders past, present and emerging from all of our lands. Today, we are very privileged to have Dr. David Federman speak to us from Hadley, Massachusetts, USA, author of over 17 books and the de developer of empowerment evaluation David is the president and CEO of Fetterman and Associates, an international evaluation consulting firm. He works with, in a wide range of settings, ranging from townships in South Africa to Google in Silicon Valley. And David has also provided consultation services for the Ministry of Education in Japan, Ministry of Health in Brazil, Ministry of Health in Ethiopia, and Tipuni Kokiri here in Aotearoa. David is the past president of the American Evaluation Association, and he has received the Lesfield Award for Outstanding Contributions to Evaluation Theory and the Myrtle Award for Cumulative Contributions to Evaluation Practice, to name a few. He has received many, many awards. Um, David was also selected um, as a top anthropologist of the decade in 2020, and this was announced in Times Square. So I'm very excited, um, like all of you are, to learn more about empowerment evaluation. So over to you, David. Great, thanks so much. I really appreciate the intro and nice to be here and uh, wonderful to see everyone again. Uh, it has been a long time because of COVID since I've been in New Zealand. So good to, good to be back, at least virtually. Let me, uh, for those who uh, don't know me very well, I'm, as, I, as she just said, a past president of the American Evaluation Association the founder of Empowerment Evaluation, and we'll be going over the key concepts, theories, steps, the whole bit of Empowerment Evaluation today. Um, those interested, I'll have another workshop uh, that's more in depth and hands-on uh, April 14th, and feel free to email me about that uh, later if, you're, if you wanna go even in more depth than we can go today. Even after we finish today, please feel free to email me and I'll get back to you as best as I can. Uh, and any questions you have or additional resources that you'd like to pursue. Happy to help well beyond this uh, uh, seminar and workshop that we're in today. So let me keep on going on the intro and uh, let me know when I've got about 15 minutes left if, if I start going too, too far, uh, so I got a little warning. And I'll try not to go too fast. I know my voice grows fast and I know the accent is strong sometimes. So bear with me, I'll do the best I can. Anyway, let's give you a little intro and before we go into too much detail on empowerment evaluation, we came up with another book, which you may be familiar with, called Collaborative, Collaborative Participatory and Empowerment Evaluation. And we wrote this because there was a lot of confusion about the approaches. And we thought, well, just let's just you know, clear it up so people can choose the most appropriate approach for the task at hand. So this book highlights the concepts, the key components, and the key examples. The best way to look at this or find the comparison, I think, is when you focus on the evaluator. So watch this, and this is Chris, you know, if you're not familiar with him, he does wonderful cartoons of evaluation work. And he, he did this one for us. And this is a good way of seeing the differences in the landscape, uh, intellectual landscape of these stakeholder involvement approaches. If you're thinking of collabor collaborative forms of evaluation, you're in charge, the evaluator's in charge, but they're collaborating with folks to in an ongoing way to make this a success. In participatory, it's more of a shared power kind of relationship where we're working together and we'll make this evaluation succeed. And the hope is that eventually they'll take over ideally, but you're pretty much leading and then, and then sharing together and moving forward. Well, I've done a lot of both collaborative and participatory, and I've never quite frankly gotten to where I wanted to go as far as really completely letting go, et cetera. So I figured why not start where you wanna finish with participatory. So I begin with empowerment, you're in charge already. And I'm your coach and facilitator. So I hope that fast kind of sweeping way of giving an idea of what the, the differences are helps you know, as we focus in on empowerment, why that is dramatically different, even though there are many commonalities, similar, similarities and, uh, very powerful synergies in working these together. So there are a lot of similarities, as we all know, in these different approaches, these stakeholder involvement approaches, but there are differences we wanna recognize. 
Uh, now, I'll try to take some pictures every so often, snapshots, and put them on the web. Feel free to use them as well as we're going through the workshop or this, the seminar today. Empowerment Evaluation is uh, operating in about 16 or 17 different countries, uh, uh, including Australia, uh, Canada, Ethiopia, Finland, New Zealand, Nepal, Mexico, South Africa. And hopefully we learn um, as much as we're giving when we are working with folks uh, all, all around the world. Uh, when I worked in a squatter settlement, uh, in, uh, if you're not familiar with those, it's like a township, but it's a little bit more desolate. It's uh, sometimes no electricity, very little water. These communities are sometimes 20,000 in size, and no one knows how many there are really in South Africa. Um, and I was spending time with this woman over here, talking to her about uh, you know, empowerment evaluation and development there. And what I learned is that it works almost anywhere. Um, the only thing you need to make empowerment evaluation work, and you're seeing how, you can see how desolate and, uh, and difficult this situation is, is the desire for a better life. So if you see her in her uh, shack over there, and you look on the right top, you see a daycare center. So there's a hope for the future, for the next generation, even in these dire circumstances. My point is, it can work almost anywhere. The examples I wanna highlight briefly today, just to give you a feel for the diversity of places this can be applied and has been used, uh, will be things like this. On the right-hand corner on top, uh, Hewlett Packard uh, gave us $15 million uh, empowerment evaluation e e effort to bridge the digital divide in communities of color. So we're, we're um, creating digital villages and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Uh, that's me in the, in the picture with my students and with video conferencing, I'll show you later with some Native American um, tribal members. In the left-hand corner on top, those are schools in academic distress in Arkansas. On the bottom left-hand corner, that's uh, us working at Stanford to get through um, uh, accreditation in the med school which we did, by the way, <laughs> luckily. Uh, uh, if you didn't, you'd be in big trouble, to say at least, because you think this should be pretty easy, but it needed quite a radical reform to actually succeed. And we'll go into that because it involved everyone, students, administrators, faculty, you name it. On the right-hand corner, I'm gonna briefly mention our Arkansas work on tobacco prevention. We've been doing that for about 15 or 16 years now. And it's basically keeping minority kids uh, away from tobacco. Anyway. I'm gonna go over those, don't worry, uh, briefly, but just to show you the many different places that this operates. Let me show you one more. And that's what we're doing now, remote. That's me in the corner on the right at Google uh, using empowerment evaluation. I work, with, I work with 52, I think, or 53 or 54 computer science education evaluators around the country that I've never met face to face. We've been doing this the way we're doing this right now remotely. What I'll show you by the end of today's seminar is how we do this remotely also that you can do at the same time using free tools like Zoom, like Google Sheets, et cetera. And that's what we've been doing. In any case, I just wanna show you well before COVID, we've been doing this remotely as well as of course, face-to-face. -face. It just depends on budget, disease in this case, uh, uh, timing, a number of factors that we all need to adjust to as evaluators. Anyway. You get the idea, it can work in a variety of different settings. So let me go over briefly the definition, the theory, concepts, and basic steps of empowerment evaluation to have a good grounding, because I'm sure some of you have a tremendous background already, some have medium, and probably some are just brand new to it from some of the um, brief emails I've gotten. Uh, so let me just walk you through as best I can each of these items. So the definition. I was, I first introduced this to the field when I was the president uh, of the American Evaluation Association 20 some odd years ago. And all it is, is the use of evaluation concepts, techniques and findings to foster improvement and self-determination. It's been the same definition for all these years. We just get a little bit more meat on the bones and said, we expanded it to explain, it's an evaluation approach that aims to increase the probability, there are no guarantees in life, increase the probability of achieving program success by providing program stakeholders with tools for assessing the planning, implementation, and self-evaluation of their program. And this is very important. Listen, this is critical. Mainstreaming evaluation as part of the planning and management of the program organization. 
you're already familiar with evaluation can be considered, oh, parasitic or taking money away from the program or they're running away from you because you know, they're afraid you're gonna have you know, bad news. This is changing the dynamic of evaluation so that it becomes part and parcel of their own management, their own planning, their day-to-day -day management of their op operation. I'll show you how to do that, don't worry. But that's a critical difference than the secondary evaluation off on the side, taking away resources. I didn't draw the tree, so don't, don't blame me. This is Marv Alkin. Um, he drew this and uh, he was trying to show the top theorists in the country where they stand. And uh, he places me over here and this limb ready to fall off any time, I'm sure, on this side of the tree. Um, and there's a lot of argument that I belong in the middle because I read about ethnography. See, I write ethnography. I do a lot of writing about treatment control design. I do a lot of methods stuff, but I think they're right. I do belong in the use one because I care mostly about what do you do with this at the bottom line? So people have argued a lot where I belong. It's in the middle. I think they put me in the right place. Um, and this is just to be you know, honest about sort of where I'm placed, where people place me as a theorist and stuff. Uh, but you know, I'm kind of basically a practitioner when it comes down to it. Uh, I, I like things to work and be useful. Let me just briefly go over some contrast and conflicts with traditional forms of evaluation and empowerment, just in case you're not as familiar with empowerment, it gives you an idea of sort of what the differences are. In traditional forms of evaluation, they're normally external, empowerment internal. Usually you have, and traditionally you have an expert on the outside. In empowerment, you have the coach or critical friend who works with the group, they're in charge, and we support their efforts and keep it rigorous, et cetera. In traditional forms of evaluation, data is considered warehoused. It's interesting, it's nothing that anyone's doing wrong, but it's the perception, and here's what happens. Get on, I get a survey, you send it out, well, you have to do another wave to get a better response rate and a better response rate of another wave and on and on. And then, you know, you got to then get it back there. And the worst thing in the world happens, you actually get all that stuff and you got to sort it and make sense out of it. That takes time. You got to do, a, you know, it goes on. You have to draft something about it. You then send it for you know, review. From their perspective, you're doing all the right things. It's warehousing because they need that data to be able to make decisions. In empowered evaluation, the data is aimed at these deadlines for decision making. It's focused on what they specifically need at a time critical kind of juncture. In traditional forms of evaluation, they may foster dependency. I've done many traditional evaluations. As you mentioned, I've gotten, Marie, you mentioned I've gotten awards. I've got a lot of great awards. I'm very proud of it. Don't get me wrong. But I know that sometimes the impact has been nanoseconds. I've done nothing. I've left with nothing. So I think as we get older, we all want to leave something more important behind. And empowerment evaluation is, is leaving that ability, you're building capacity, you're leaving something behind for them to be able to do the basics of evaluation without you. So you're fostering self-determination and capacity building in empowerment evaluation. In traditional forms of evaluation, you have independent judgment and there's nothing wrong with that. It's great, we all should have independent judgment. The problem is very often it's not according to the life cycle of the organization. So you might have some phenomenally talented groups of folks coming in and they'll evaluate it as if the program was 10 years old and it's only one year old and you'll kill it because you can't hold to that standard. So uh, the independent judgment is wonderful but too often it's not rooted in where the group is at that time. In empowerment evaluation, you are doing the at a collaborative moment in real time. Traditional evaluation, they really in my experience has go beyond the demonstration time, six months, a year, three years, whatever it might be. It doesn't, an empowerment evaluation is kind of the opposite. It just keeps going. It enhances sustainability. There doesn't have to be an end. I've been in projects where I've worked with them, had to take off. They've got new superintendents, you name it, whatever goes on. I, I come back, they're still doing some part of it. Not as great as it was before, but they continue. And then we build on that, Oakland Public School System. They asked me to come back. I came back after 10 years. And guess what? They were doing a modest amount and we just built on that again because people have this opportunity to fix what's wrong in their organization and people want to fix it. It's a window of opportunity that this presents for them to do something, not some external body. Anyway, let's keep on going. I do want to highlight that these are not mutually uh, exclusive. They can work together well, but they should be rooted in the internal concerns of an organization. 
So we have, a, I think it's six hours to go over theory. Is that right, Marie? Six, six hours or seven hours? To, it's, no, I'm, I know. Hang in there, everybody. I know. I see everybody. I'm talking a couple minutes. Don't worry. Hang in there with me. I just want to mention a couple theories, very, I promise, within just a couple minutes. The first theory that's the most important that guides empowerment evaluation is process use. The more that people engage in the act of conducting their own evaluations, the more likely it is that they will find the results credible and act on the recommendations. Why? Because they're theirs. I can say this all this brilliant stuff, whatever, but as soon as I'm gone, it's like, eh, I don't know. When you have ownership because people have their own ideas and voices on the table, they're more likely to find them credible and, and stick with them. This is critical because the biggest problem in the field, never mind empowerment evaluation, the biggest problem in the field of evaluation is knowledge utilization. Too much good work, very good work, sits and simply gathers dust on people's shelves. No sense of ownership. What do you do with it? Empowerment helps turn that around in a very powerful way. Two more theories, and I promise I'll stop on the theories, but these are cool. How many, I don't know how many of you have been to England. It's a, uh, if you have, uh, you've probably seen this sign, if, Mind the Gap. For those who haven't seen it, uh, I first was doing a project over in England and I was coming from my hotel room to the tube, you know, the, the subway train thing. And I hear, Mind the Gap, really loud. I go, what the heck is it, Gap jeans? Or I didn't know what, but you know, and my mind was focused on what the project is and personalities and funds, you know, all that kind of normal stuff. I get on the tube, I go to the work, we all start arguing about what needs to be done and moving forward. We have some pretty optimistic ideas about, you know, where things are going to go. Uh, but we have a lot of detailed stuff to do still for the next, you know, week or so or two. So I go back to the hotel room, about five or six, whatever. And I'm getting off of the tube again. And I hear, mind the gap, really loud again. I go, what the? This is a foot and a half gap. I could have killed myself. Right? And my first thought, tunnel vision. That's a problem evaluation. Of course. Let me explain. On the one side, you have something called the theory of action. That's the espoused theory of the organization. Equity, fairness, um, you know, uh, ma and apple pie, all this wonderful, great stuff. On the other side, you have this thing called the theory of use. That's the observed real behavior. And in life, in an empowerment evaluation, you're supposed to mind the gap between what people say they're doing and what they're actually doing. And in fact, not only mind the gap, but close the gap so that people start to walk their talk by feeding back information about what they're observing, what they're seeing, what's happening with that spouse theory of what you're supposed to be doing. Anyway, enough on the theories, I promised it wouldn't be long, but you can see how powerful that is in shaping the lens that we're gonna look through for the rest of today. Now, let me just throw a couple concepts out here. If you wanna see more of this as an academic medicine, we wrote an article about going through accreditation, using empowerment evaluation at Stanford University's uh, School of Medicine. And I think it's useful just to keep in the back of your mind. The core of empowerment really is evidence. You're collecting evidence and you're getting people used to using evidence when they have an opinion, there's usually evidence that they have in their minds, but you're helping them make it explicit. You get a critical friend, someone who's going to work with you, who believes in what you're doing, but because they do, they're going to be more honest. They're going to be very, they want it to work. So if it's not working, they're going to let you know and help you be focused. You're working on a culture of evidence. We're now putting our opinions forward, but what's the evidence for it? And we're sharing that explicitly so that we can work with it and be credible. We have cycles of reflection and action where we, and that's just analysis, if you want to call it another term for reflection, you're thinking about the data as to what you collected and how it's working, but then you do something with it. You implement and actually pursue that. And then you reflect on that, you collect data on that and you analyze. So it's a constant cycle. You're building a community of learners when you're doing empowerment evaluation. None of us know it all, including me. We're all learning together in this process. And ideally we're creating reflective practitioners where we're all trying to do better. We're trying to question what we're doing a little bit more every day and how can we refine that and, and improve. Anyway, I just want you to have that in the back of your mind today. Uh, not, nothing critical, but it helps you give a, once again, an idea of key concepts that guide an empowerment evaluation approach. I wanna highlight this one because I used to argue and you know Scriven, right? Michael Scriven, we used to argue like crazy. He'd say, David, you know, in life, 
as an adult, you don't have a coach to help you out. You have to go and do stuff yourself, you know, and survive. And I thought, well, he's got a point. So I went home and I thought about it for a while. I went, wait a minute. My daughter has a coach for volleyball. You think I'm going to let her play without having some coaching? You think I'm going to let her do this horse bolting thing without a coach? I don't think so. I was, my only exercise before was I'd be going from the parking lot to my class to teach. So I went back to a gym. So I helped, you know, I'd get back in shape. I'm not going to do that without a coach. Am I crazy? And I started thinking about it more and more. You think some of my students in the med school are going to let them just go and operate? I don't think so. They're going to be coached and mentored. I mean, a, a financial advisor is a coach, right? So, I mean, as the more I thought about this, I thought, no, he's completely wrong. I'm right. We all have coaches and we should have coaches. Why not in evaluation? So anyway, not to go on too long about it, but this became a long series of arguments that I finally, and I listen to people and I really take people seriously when they argue with me about these things. And I thought about it and then I, but I do look at the data. I look at reality and it was wrong. We all need a coaches. There's nothing wrong with having that in evaluation. And a critical friend, basically someone who believes in the type of program, like I might believe in programs for dropouts, but I may be even hypercritical that I want this one to work because I believe in the concept so much. So it helps ensure an honest but constructive critique and self-assessment, including uh, across grantees. Linda Delaney works with me. She's an empowerment evaluator in Arkansas where we've been working together for I think 12 or 13 or more years. And we're trying to help communities of color uh, really keep youth away from tobacco as much as possible, which is harder than you might think because the industry is so powerful and persuasive. It's incredible. They really know the, the, the psychology of how to persuade adults as well, of course, but certainly youth. But basically, in an empowerment evaluation, you're taking charge of your own evaluation and you're having the assistance of an empowerment evaluator, once again, as a coach. I wanna just highlight some key principles. We won't go into all of them now. We have a whole book on this, but there, there are key principles that guide empowerment evaluation. Um, and we wrote these up because we started seeing a lot of stuff that looked like it, but wasn't quite empowerment. So we thought, let's be explicit about what we mean. Well, it should be aimed at improvement. It should be involved with community ownership. There should be inclusion, and I'll highlight inclusion in a little more detail in a second. There should be democratic participation. There should be an aim at social justice. There are so many issues that we need to deal with. Let's focus on them. Let's use this completely appropriate tool to help bring some, some fairness, some equity, some, some, some rationality, basically, to what we're doing where we're creating so many injustices. Community knowledge needs to be respected. At the same time, we respect evidence-based strategies. We don't just throw them out because they haven't always worked. Scholarship sometimes needs to be adapted, not adopted. If you're not doing capacity building and helping people learn how to do the basics of this by doing it themselves, then you're not doing empowerment evaluation. You have to be helping them learn how to do this themselves. In the process, you're creating organizational learning, and bottom line, it's a wonderful process. People love it, but it's also about accountability. Did you do it? And that's what we're gonna highlight as we go through a number of slides here and move forward. Before we do that, let me just highlight inclusion a, a little bit more if you don't mind. Just to give you an idea, and this is a real story. When I was, once again, the president of the association, I first introduced empowerment evaluation and I got up and I got a very special guest speaker, double Nobel laureate. And I said, I was on the podium and I said, you know, I, I've read his work as a, as a kid. I read his work still as an adult. I won't spend the whole morning introducing him to you. I will let him speak for himself. Let me introduce to you, Dr. Albert Einstein. Everyone goes, wait a minute. Didn't he die quite a few years ago? Has, has David been in California too long? It's like, you know, I hired an actor and he was brilliant. He uses all of Einstein's words. I taught him for about six months about evaluation and about empowerment evaluation, and people were thrilled. Now, it almost, however, was a flop. Here's what happened. He uses those remote mics, you know, you have on your hip, so you can walk around and talk and stuff like that. So he had one of those things. And keep in mind, this is what he looked like. His hair is out like this, his sweater's all over the mess. He's got a big arm gestures, that sort of thing. He's talking. And his voice is going like at this, and, 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 because the microphone was not connecting well. 
Well, my dad was very mechanical and he, he taught me a lot. And I could see there was a crack in the plastic. And if I was to close that, the battery would connect and he'd be okay. So I saw that and I thought, oh, I know how to solve this. Keep in mind, I got, a, I think a three piece suit in those days or at least two piece suit, whatever. A cowboy hat, because we were in Texas. So we're going with the theme of Texas, right? Gold stars to show for all the board members. If you needed help, you go to. So we were just having fun with that. Think of this, I'm behind this guy who's got Einstein look to him and I'm holding on to his hips to hold on to the battery. He's still moving. So I'm behind him while he's trying to talk and no one's paying attention anymore because you see me dancing around behind him with this cowboy hat and the suit and he's just trying to like all this. So I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm gonna flop. They're not gonna understand what empowerment evaluation is about. It's a radical new idea at the time. Uh, you know, we have very critical colleagues who didn't believe in the idea of letting go of this process, letting people engage and be part of the thing. And if I let go, it'll be the other word they'll hear. So I'm, what a dilemma, right? Well, we have thousands of people there in the audience ready to flop. It's a great new idea, but it's not going to come through. Well, there's this one guy in the audience who I happen to like a lot, just a small town kind of person. And I think I came from a pretty small town. And a lot of people didn't care for him because he likes to talk computers 24 seven. And I like him. I don't know what the deal is. So I like to talk to him, not for 24 seven, but you know, he's a nice guy. Who's the one person in the thousands of people who brought us an old fashioned microphone with a cord, save the day, inclusion. Your weakest link from some organizational perspective might be the person who saves the day. Diversity is additive and critical. It's not something just cute and humanitarian, it's necessary. And inclusion is part of that. So sorry to get into so much detail about it, but you get the idea. That's why these principles I'm highlighting are so important. This is just one of them. If you wanna learn a lot more about all the different principles shaping and guiding empowerment evaluation, we have it in this book, Empowerment Evaluation Principles and Practice. It's also in Japanese and some other languages uh, if you wanna pursue that in more detail. And it's good to have just because most of us, at least, you know, me, I, at least I get lost in an evaluation and I've been doing this for, you know, decades and decades. Uh, it's nice to go back and go, oh yeah, I really, I'm not focusing on capacity building enough or I'm not focusing enough on improvement or have I strayed too much away from the core social justice issues I really should be sure, pursuing. It's a good reminder. So anyway, if you want to pursue it, this more depth here. Why not get to the steps? That's what we're here for today, huh? We just sort of, as long as we're here anyway, let's go over the basic steps of empowerment evaluation. There are only three. So my mom's a professor retired. She's gonna say, she always says to me, David, do you test them? I say, they're adults. I'm not gonna just ask everybody, how many are there? Three, you can say, I, I don't worry, I don't have to hear you. Just let me, three, how many? Yep. Three steps. Thank you. My mom will be happy. You think I'm kidding? I call her every day, see how she's doing. She's 94 years old. We just moved over here to make sure we sort of you know stick with her and see how she's doing. Three steps. Mission, taking stock, and planning for the future. That's all there is to this process. Let me go over them in a little bit of depth, and you'll see how incredibly simple this is for anyone to pursue in much more depth immediately. So the first step, mission. I'll say, you know, where are you? What's your purpose? What's your, you know, focus here? And, and, and it's very democratic. They'll just say what they're about. And you have someone write it down that has better handwriting than me, or if you don't, you, then you have you write it down yourself on butcher block paper before COVID. I'll show you what we do using Google Sheets when we do it remotely. It's the same concept, but we're using Google Sheets. But in the old days, and when we come back to being able to do more face-to-face, Guess what? We'll go back to poster paper and magic marker. You don't need a lot of money. They put down key ideas and thoughts about what the purpose is here. It's very democratic, it's very transparent. You're getting at group values um, and you honor the existing mission, but you go where the energy is in the room because that could have been written by a grant writer, the mission or the director, or maybe it is a good part of the staff five or six years ago and there's been 40% turnover. What does it represent? So you wanna go back to it. A lot of people tell me, David, we already have a mission. Let's skip that. No, this is mental scaffolding and get people's minds ready to do an evaluation. You can't just jump into it. And if you don't do this, you'll have mission creep where people think they're on the same page, but they're not. It only takes an hour. Take the time. 
go over what do we all think we believe in here? What are we trying to accomplish? One of the things that happens in this process, by the way, and I'm sure you've all experienced this, is this question of giving voice and making meaning. If you're not familiar with the terminology, I'm sure you've all been at a meeting, made an interesting point, and you're ignored. Or you've made a point and you put down for it. Or my favorite, you make an interesting point, not the greatest point in the world, but a good point. And someone who says, who has higher stature, more rep reputation, higher up in the ranks, says the exact same thing. And everyone goes, oh, wasn't that a good idea? Familiar, I know, isn't it? You know what I'm talking about. That's not being allowed to give voice or make meaning. Empowerment evaluation does the opposite, as you'll see, where you're compelled to have your voice heard. It changes the dynamic quite a bit. So anyway, you get the idea. You can put it on poster sheets, keywords. You don't have to go into great detail yet. And don't turn it into a wordsmithing operation now because people will get bored and leave. You can do that a week or two or an hour or two later after the meeting, but just mentally get it down in keywords, phrases on a sheet of paper or Google Sheets, as we'll see. And I put paper around the entire room with magic markers and the whole bit. Anyway, it sets the tone for then taking stock. Taking stock has two parts. The first part is brainstorming. Just list as many of the key activities that you think in the group, that the group thinks are critical to making that mission possible. There's no wrong answer. Communication could be teaching, funding. You could have 50, you could have 100 different activities. It doesn't matter. You list them all out, once again, on uh, poster paper or, once again, on Google Sheets. And I'm very California-esque, even though I moved over here to Massachusetts recently, about you know, a year ago. I give everybody dots. You know, Everybody gets five dots. You put them where you think are the most important activities for us to assess and rate from this point on as a group. People go, Dave, that's not very quantitative. I go, count the dots. Whatever got the most dots, the top 10 will pick and they will rate those. It's just a simple process of prioritization. You don't have to use this approach. I've used other approaches and they've taken me three to four hours. This takes about three to four minutes. You choose. I'm just putting it out there. It's been very effective and it's transparent. People can see honestly where the group put their emphasis and where they didn't at that time. You still save this list, by the way, because they may gravitate towards other things as it becomes organizationally more mature. Anyway, you get the idea. First part is just brainstorming and prioritization. What are the most, you can't do everything in life and certainly not in evaluation. What are the most important things to focus on? Once you have those, you put them in an Excel spreadsheet. That's what we like to do. And you can, once again, put that on a poster sheet and have people come up and put their ratings on there and then transfer it to an Excel spreadsheet because you want to have that physical activity of connecting all the way through, even through this process, so there's a sense of ownership in this thing. In any case, they put down the top 10 items on the left-hand column, as you can see, and then you put your initials. There's nothing confidential about this process. I want to know what you think. You need to know what I think. Can't be done in some abstract way. So those are my initials, DF. DE is another person, SEC is another person, and you have the whole all of us there, and we put our rating on how well are we doing in each of these things. So this is a real abbreviated example of an accreditation effort we did in San Francisco for the California Institute of Integral Studies, communication. I put down a three. Well, that's not good enough. Why a three? Well, communication was awful. We never had an agenda for any of our meetings. Uh, we had overlapping uh, meetings uh, scheduled. And we have this weird impromptu call where someone would just call in the middle of the day and say, oh, stop what you're doing, let's sit and meet. I have you know, meetings set up for weeks and weeks and weeks. I, I can't just drop everything. So I thought, those, those are my evidence. My evidence is critical. That lets me know when we get to plans for the future what my strategy should be. So we can't forget what I said as the evidence. In any case, the secretary happens to have those initials SEC and she gives it a three. She's a better social scientist than me. She sees the overlapping meetings that are scheduled. So she says, you're closer to this guy in the middle. Would you mind uh, you know, asking him why a six? So of course, who gives it such a high six? The dean. I go, oh, okay. 
why in the heck are you giving a six when all of us are giving you twos, threes, fours? He says, David, from my perspective, we communicate very well compared to the entire institute. So if we had done just a survey, we would not have known that. It would just have been lost in the averaging. So in the process, we created both internal and external communication right there. You never do that in traditional evaluation. Oh my gosh, you don't want to change the variables and you know, definition. No, it's more accurate. Now we know what we're defining. You're defining sometimes as you're going along with greater specificity versus having everything perfectly defined and then going nowhere because people can't agree on it and they can't move forward. You can't turn into a completely scholarly activity. It's got to be rigorous scholarly in terms of the quality, but the process is something you work with people at their own pace in a very real way. Um, you have to be a facilitator. In any case, you've got the three, you've got the six, you've got the three. He changed it. We didn't have to because he now knew what we were talking about. Now, I won't go into all the examples here, but you can see we also total and have the average across. So communication on in general for the group is four. Teaching six, this is our baseline. We can look at this again in six months after our interventions and see if we've changed and improved. And this is critical, look at this. If I came in and we went, we just had a talk right now, we've only been together for a little while, right? And I say, you know, based on what I've heard or listened to, you know, I'll give everybody here a 4.25 on a 10 point scale. You go, David, stay in the States. You don't know us, you don't. If you give it to yourself, you go, David, how can you help us? You see the dynamic change that happens when you let people evaluate themselves? It's powerful, it's illuminating. Let me give one more example. I don't want to take up too much time, but in product development, that's when you have these brochures you give out about programs so that other students know they can come and go to your school, uh, your parents know about it, you name it. I gave it a one because I didn't see anything going on in the school. This, I didn't see any distribution of material, any kind of product development at all. And the person responsible for it is about, I don't know, 15, 14, 15 feet away from me, from his office. The secretary didn't see much at all, more than I saw, but not much. So once again, who is it? The dean. I go, why are you giving it an eight? When we see nothing, he goes, David, I do over a thousand brochures a month. I do public television every month. I go, he went on and on. He was doing a ton. I was wrong. But he was wrong because he didn't communicate internally all the stuff he's doing so that we would know we have an asset literally 15 feet away from my office. And I didn't even know what he was doing. It's like most of us, we don't know what our colleagues are doing only 10 feet, five feet away from us. So sometimes this process is not just evaluation, it's illumination about the resources that we have within. It's learning, not just accountability. Anyway, you get the idea. I don't mean to go on too much on this, but you see how powerful this is, it's so cool. But you've got mission, taking stock has basically the first part is just prioritizing because you can't do everything. And it's not necessary to do everything at one stage or another of the life cycle of the organization. You pick the critical ones at that time. And then you read, and you, but the evidence is critical. Every time I provide evidence, guess what? We go to plans for the future and the goals will be communication, improved communication. The strategies in this case will be taken from the evidence. The evidence is that we now have agendas. I could come up with this brilliant idea of a kiosk online so what? It's not related to what the concerns were. It's technically correct and it's a great idea, but it's irrelevant. You listen to the evidence as a way of also not just respecting what people are saying, but using it as the tool to move forward and improve on those specific items. Isn't that cool? That's what makes it intellectually coherent and that's why this works so well. Anyway, let me keep on buzzing along because I love this. You can use this for anything. So hang in there with me. You'll see what I mean, I'm not kidding. We create evaluation dashboards, empowerment evaluation dashboards. They're very simple, but once you've done you know, a mission, you've taken stock of where you are and you have a plan for the future, you gotta monitor where you're going, right? Well, it's gotta be simple, straightforward, transparent. We have a transparent dashboard that has goals, milestone, milestones along the way, every quarter in this case, actual performance. And of course, baseline where we were last year, for example. Look at what this looks like, it's so cool. Actual performance, milestones, baseline, goals, watch. In our tobacco-free environment, in other words, we're creating 
tobacco-free parks for the kids in Arkansas. This is a, it's a beautiful example of how this works. In this county, we had one already. So that's your baseline, okay? So you leave that behind. That's great, that's over there. You wanna recognize it, but we wanna know what do we do in this year? Well, we wanna create four of them this year, right? Okay, so four, all the way across. That's what we're gonna do, four. When you don't know what you're doing, you just divide by four. But yeah, and you get one, one more is two, one more is three, one more is four. Then you don't have to do anything else during the year except actual performance. Once you've agreed on your milestones, goals, and you know what your baseline is, the only thing you're asking folks to do is what did you do? So they put down zero. Do you slap them on the wrist? No, that's the whole point. You don't slap them on the wrist for not making it. You go, okay, who else knows how to do this in the community? So we get someone else in, a, in, a, in an African-American community that's similar to the one we are working in. What are you doing? She comes up, she tells us, well, we have the kids put the cigarette butts in these clear plastic bags. Well, I'm thinking that's nice, but that doesn't do it for me for creating a tobacco-free park. Uh, she says, I'm not done. We then take that bag and the kids bring it to the city council meeting with a journalist taking pictures. Of course, they're gonna say, yeah, we need signage and keeping tobacco there. If I did it, white researcher from Stanford, or what, yeah, nice idea, we'll get to it next year. It's like, you know, end the year, you know, but the kids and a picture, local people, boom. So they borrowed that idea and sure enough, the next quarter they got one. They didn't get two, but they got one. My point is you use this tool to monitor your own performance. We can see it as evaluators to help them out. The sponsor can help them out and see it's a flag. They can monitor and know that they need help. We can all jump in not to slap them on the wrist, not to stigmatize and demonize and all the rest of the stuff that we tend to do with when we're doing assessment, but to help do what we're supposed to be doing, diagnostic and oh, and have these feedback loops before the end of the year so you can make mid-course corrections. Because the goal still makes sense, but maybe the tools they had, the activities are not the right ones. Anyway, you get the idea, pretty cool. And which, look, you use regular bar charts that you're used to. Most people won't read any of our reports. You know that and I know that, but they will look at bar charts and go, oh my gosh, I can see the progress. See that blue line is close to the orange one. Well, it's meeting it in the third quarter. They, they have a high probability of making it on track, being on track and making it to their goals at the end of the year. Anyway, I love this thing. So I want to make sure I share this with you before we uh, uh, end the seminar, that's for sure. Um, but you see the idea, mission, taking stock, planning for the future, then use an evaluation dashboard so they can monitor themselves. Anyway, pretty cool. When we do get to you know, the plans for the future, can we go back there for a second? And we say communication is something uh, we want to, to improve, right? Look around the room and say, uh, who, you spoke about communication the most, would you mind taking the lead on that? Not have to do it all, but take, then you've institutionalized it. Because the next meeting you have, not an evaluation meeting, the next meeting, I ask, where is it? Where, where are we? And other folks who cared about that will group together with you and come up with ideas. So you don't have to do it all, but you see how you have that individual accountability and you've internalized it into their normal system. Anyway, let me keep on zooming along. And once again, these dashboards, you might see in the middle that they've already exceeded their annual goals. Well, trust me, uh, the, the environments that I work in, I have to work with the legislature in Arkansas and other places with a lot of accountability. You can go in the middle of the year, like ours in January, they, they meet. And if you're not meeting, never mind exceeding your goals, they might take the money away. Are they, should they? Of course not. You're supposed to wait for at least the year, give us full time to do it. If you have the data on a continual basis to be able to share, whether it's reporters, legislators, other citizens, community members, you name it, you are in a defensible position. Because I do believe in advocacy if the data merit it. You don't just sit on it. You use it to show this is what we're accomplishing. We think we deserve the money to keep on moving forward. So anyway, to summarize what I've highlighted so far in our language that we use in evaluation, taking stock is really the baseline because then we're gonna do an intervention which is the plans for the future. But you gotta measure that, right? So you have interim measures, those are the milestones every quarter in our case. The reflection and action are the mid course corrections they make each quarter when they realize they're not quite doing what they should be doing or they're doing it and they wanna improve and go even further. Then you take stock again, three to six to, I don't know, eight months later, depending on the 
to taking the uh, plans for the future, the intervention, and you see, have we made any changes from that first baseline of ratings to where we are now after doing this intervention? You've institutionalized evaluation to their planning and management. That's cool. Now, what I wanna make a transition to as uh, quickly as I can, key examples, very brief, and keep track of my time as I'm getting closer. But we got, we're still good, but I wanna make sure we, we have enough time for a little bit of Q and A. Accountability and outcomes. It's a wonderful process, but you do ask in empowerment evaluation, did you do it? That's the bottom line still. So I just wanna briefly highlight some examples today. Like I mentioned earlier, in Arkansas, we have academically distressed schools. In Hewlett Packard, it's a $15 million digital divide um, kind of uh, program or effort. In Stanford University, it's the School of Medicine getting through accreditation. In Arkansas, it's tobacco prevention. So let me, just, I'm gonna breeze through these just give you a feel for the different kind of ways in which uh, it can be applied. This is in Arkansas. And um, I was in, in my office at Stanford. I got all these um, requests to come down and help them with their schools. And they started sending me boxes and boxes and boxes of records. And I've been doing this for a long, long time, evaluating school systems, usually urban uh, public school systems. And the attendance in this school was extremely, extremely high. And the score and performance was outrageously low. I've never heard of such a thing, never. Usually you have low performance, they become truants, they drop out, they leave, doesn't make any sense to me. On top of that, this is the town. There's almost nothing to, but that's the point. If you drive down to some of these communities, I flew from you know California over to Arkansas, Little Rock, got a rental car, I went down through fields of cotton, rice fields. I mean, all I did is keep on driving. And guess what? There's nothing out there. And then you hit this kind of town. So the attendance was high. They weren't lying. There's nothing else to do. You're gonna sit in the cornfield or a cotton field or something. So, but the scores were horrendous, horrendous. Um, what do we do? We used the impound evaluation. We asked, what are the issues? And the issues are updating parents, teaching, planning, cooperation, you name it. And we did it, we did the ratings. How well are we doing? Well, we got a 4.7 on updating parents, pretty pathetic. Guess what? Less than six months later during this process, 6.2. Improvements all the way across the board. Why? Because we were able to make mid-course corrections. We tried a number of things, they didn't always work. So we tried something else until we got it working. Updating parents, once again, I could have come up with this great kiosk idea of keeping everything on record on, online. Half the folks didn't have electricity, half the folks didn't have computers. It's like, that was a crazy idea. But the old fashioned piece of paper and the kid's knapsack, came, they came up with that one, it worked. So my point is using their ideas, we moved forward. You could say, David, with scores of that low, in the nation, why didn't you just fire everybody? Let me go back a second. Are you willing to go to here to live there for three years with me to help change things? I don't think so. You have to work with the people you've got. So we brought in all sorts of faculty and other folks with state turnover, uh, takeover money to work and teach with them at the same time so they wouldn't lose face and learn how to teach a little bit better with the students at the same time. We brought in all sorts of instructional assistance uh, to bear. And it worked. We brought test scores, they were like 59% were at the 25th percentile. And the, in the States, that's about as low as you can go. And that incredibly short period of time, we got it down to only 38%. That was unheard. For six years before us, it was only going further and further down. And we're not specialists uh, you know, in any particular area aside from evaluation. You probably, if folks who already know me, know I'm a very simple, methodical kind of guy. We use Stanford Binet the way you're supposed to use it, diagnostic, not to brag about how bright your kid is and put it on, your, on the shoulder of a, or sleeve of a parent. It, you have a problem in math, what's the problem? Rounding, let's work on rounding, 3.5, okay? That's four, let's do it again. Let's do it again, let's do it again. And now let's test. It, you narrow in, what's the problem? Not this kids can't learn or what, you know, it's nonsense. What's the issue? Find it, work on it. And that's all we did. Let me skip over to the next one. This is also, we worked with about uh, 
18 different tribes, uh, Native American tribes in San Diego, who didn't usually work together uh, on a routine basis. And look at that, we use the same process. You can see the uh, blue and the purple. That's the basically the taking stock. Uh, and then we did the intervention and we took stock again. I think it was three or six months later. And we saw whether we had improvements, in this case, almost in every stage. You can see on the left-hand corner on the bottom, guess what came up? Communication. It's a normal thing that comes up. If it's not communication, guess what? It's funding. I already know some of the things that'll come up. The others will be idiosyncratic, but if you want to know what the top two are, no matter what, where you are in the world, in New Zealand too, by the way, when I was over there doing this, communication came up and funding came up. The other ones were idiosyncratic, yes, but no question about it. And in this case, it was kind of funny because on the left-hand corner, one of the things that they did rate was communication uh, was a problem. Well, this guy was talking, they were, he was being interrupted at the same time because they couldn't even communicate on the basic, basic level without arguing with each other about stuff. At the same time, we were very um, sensitive to the cultural traditions and respectful. So we had the elders do the luncheon uh, ceremony for the, uh, the prayers uh, during uh, each of the breaks. And we also did not distribute the uh, reports unless we had their um, uh, approval. Even though they weren't always the primary part of the process, um, they were who we respect in the elders. And uh, that's what you do in every culture. And in Maori as well, we did the same thing before we went anywhere. We made sure we had all the folks that were uh, uh, the key players that were senior uh, speak and shape where we're going and understand it. And, and you, it only makes sense. I don't see why people, you know, don't pay attention to, to what I consider basic uh, uh, respect. Anyway, this is just one example and watch this. This is my class at Stanford. And what we're doing is we're video conferencing with Native Americans in San Diego. This picture, I kid you not, is worth $15 million. Euler Packer, this is face validity that it was working, that they were able to use the internet to bridge the digital divide in these communities of color, in this case, with Stanford on planning, on moving forward, selling part of their broadband, creating a digital printing press, I mean, a whole bunch of cool things. And they love this. We take a lot of pictures. We didn't know they were gonna love this one so much, but to them, this is what worked. So in the earlier one that you just saw, you saw um, statistics as far as uh, test scores. That was the language of power. In this case, the language of power that was persuasive were pictures. So there are many different ways of being persuasive. I'm not gonna say there's only one, you need to find what is the language of power that speaks to the group that you're working with. By the way, they built the largest wireless system in the country, an unlicensed wireless system. And I heard about that before I even knew that. Uh, I was driving to a different project in Oakland and heard it on the radio uh, from the um, uh, public radio. Let me move over to Stanford very quickly if I could. Um, what we did is I was the director of uh, School of Medicine's evaluation program, and um, they were in terrible shape uh, from an academic perspective, from an accreditation perspective. Um, the accrediting board was not happy with Stanford at the time. So we used empowerment evaluation to transform the curriculum. So for those familiar with this process, it's a flexitarian model it used to be the model of having like a couple years of science, and then you move into clinical activity. And a lot of times, Students, after they finished a couple of years of science, they actually have to deal with a patient and go, oh, I don't want to do this. Well, we just wasted a slot. Why not have clinical activity from day one? And that's what we do. Uh, and then how about evaluating it? Bottom line, without going into much detail, by having everyone engaged in this empowerment process, students, faculty, staff, you name it, we were able to show statistical significance on the transformation that we helped create uh, in the curriculum uh, at 0 0.04, by the way. And it made it into an academic medicine article for those who want to see more detail about it. I highlight this only because that was the language of power in academic medicine. I don't recommend it. It's a ridiculous amount of energy and effort to put into proving your point about whether it works, but that was appropriate for this audience. So once again, pictures for some folks, statistical significance for another folks, um, test scores for another, you find the language of power for the group you're working with as you do in all evaluation, 
And that's what you speak to and the language you speak in. This one, most of us are familiar with this one, this language, money. In this case, Arkansas Tobacco Prevention Program, we looked at ROI. They were ready to sort of gut our program, take our money away because of politics. This governor was going for president, uh, to be a president of the United States. So he wanted to steal our money from tobacco and, and put it into obesity because that was a sexier topic than tobacco. Even though tobacco is like the number one killer that's preventative uh, uh, that you could do something about uh, in the world as well as the United States, but it's not as sexy as other topics. In any case, bottom line is we're still working on this effort and we think it's pretty important. And if you look at us individually as grantees or groups trying to do something about this throughout the state, you'd be very unimpressed. The women's group, very unimpressive in terms of the amount and number of people they're helping. Asian Pacific, same thing, on and on. But if you put us together, we are incredibly impressive. We were able to show the Black Caucus and the Senate that we were saving the state over $84 million in excess medical costs because of our program. Trust me, I speak in front of all sorts of groups, legislative groups, powerful groups, and they are like talking, talking, talking. They're not listening to you at all. They've already made their assessment. You're there pro forma. You could hear a pin drop when we showed them this. There's nothing uh, manipulative about it. We took uh, CDC calculations and Arkansas Department of, Educa uh, of, Value, uh, of, Medicine, of um, Health uh, calculations and figures to come up with this. So it was totally transparent how we came up with the figures. And this is a conservative calculation of how much we were saving. This helped keep the program alive because uh, we focused on return on investment. What's interesting about this that I just want to throw out there is that when you do an empowerment evaluation, aside from showing the kind of outcomes we're highlighting today, there's a lot of serendipity, things that come out of it that you would never have imagined. In this case, after we finished this and saved ourselves from you know, demise, basically, uh, and getting our funds taken away, um, we all sat down and most of the folks said, David, we did it, but we could never do this again. This is like insane. Uh, we need to come up with an, a, an evaluation center here in Arkansas. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, great idea. It wasn't my idea, but I couldn't say no to helping because of course this is like quarter what I'm about. So we got in there and we worked together, but it was their idea. And you know what? It passed the house. We put it into the Senate. They passed there and the governor signed it into legislation. So there is now an Arkansas evaluation center. So they don't have to constantly reinvent the wheel to get the basic things that we need for figures from pregnant uh, young women, they're smoking, um, uh, you know, juveniles. I mean, we were killing ourselves going to every group we could think of to figure out where things were. Why do that from scratch over and over again, have something like this as a container? And also we conducted the first and second uh, minority evaluator uh, training uh, in Oxford at no cost to them, we got it funded. So we did a lot of cool things and we're still uh, you know, pretty pleased. But once again, this came out of nowhere. This came out of memorandums of agreement for groups that usually compete against each other because we thought it was so important, comes out of these kinds of processes. Anyway. Um, David, me, it's, yeah. um, it's one o'clock now. Ah, Just thank, you, thank you. Beautiful, thank you. So we have about, uh, is it 15 more minutes? Um, the we officially have half an hour more, so the okay. the chat function is getting um, yeah. There's a lot of interesting um, questions Good. for you, so just oh, good, good, good. Yeah, uh, perfect. Then we'll Take leave about twenty yeah. minutes. We'll okay. have fifteen to twenty minutes for Q and A. Cool. Uh, so it's timing off just right. Perfect. Thank right. you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to have a couple more things, and then we're going to open up the Q and A. So uh, I think about forty five seconds off, but we're close. Okay. Now I want to show you just quickly everything I've, I've highlighted. But what we're doing now online, just so you know, this can be done online, not just face to face. And once again, those who are very interested and wanna get more of a hands-on, where we have a lot of time for actual participation, et cetera, we'll be doing this on April 14th. You can email me about it and et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, right now I'm involved in an empowerment evaluation in India, where we're trying to eliminate uh, tuberculosis. Uh, so here's a just a quick example to show you what it looks like when you're using Google Sheet and, um, and uh, Zoom. 
So if you're not familiar with what's going on in India, briefly, um, TB is both preventable and curable, but it's still around the top 10 causes of death globally. And, 20, and India has 27% of the TB uh, burden. So USAID is sponsoring us uh, to create community-based initiatives because the ministry realizes it's not gonna happen just from policy top down, that we have to have a community base. So they're in support of this 100%. And I'm working with a resource group for education and advocacy for community health called REACH. They're using empowerment evaluation to accomplish its objectives. Uh, and the idea is to eliminate tuberculosis by 2025, an ambitious goal prior to the UN global target. So this is a big deal and an incredible challenge, but we're, we're right there. You can see we're using basically mostly Zoom in the center over here. Uh, and just like we're communicating right now. In some cases, we're working on masks and we're, faced, we're making sure we have distance. We were in local communities, so we're also doing that. Uh, but a lot of it, as you'll see on the right-hand side, is Google Sheets. You see where it says, reach allies, empowerment evaluation, November 10th and 11th. Step two, ratings and dialogue. Look familiar? We have all of our initials on the far right on top and our, our ones, our fives, and we're giving the evidence and we're talking like we're talking now to share that information. It's all doable, you see? Very simple, using Zoom and Google Sheets. It's free. Uh, or if you wanna pay for the Zoom one for more time, you go for that. You can record it for those who couldn't make it. Those who couldn't make it can go to Google Sheets later and add their ratings. A lot of flexibility for the situation. Three, Steps, mission, taking stock, and planning for the future. Every one of them, look at this, mission, creating an enabling environment for communities, creating powerful advocates, establish a community-owned mechanism, uh, empowering the community for sustainability. They're writing these things. I'm not writing these things. They're, we're all online together all over the world, mostly in India here, and they're jotting these things down, which we can turn into a paragraph or a page later, but you wouldn't do it right away in a face-to-face -face one because you don't want to lose the momentum in facilitating this process. So mission, taking stock, look familiar? Instead of using poster sheet paper, which is of course fine and great, uh, very, we're all familiar with it, but when you're working remotely, Google Sheets, you put down the ratings in the center here, and then you have, I put down the average ratings over here in the center. They put their initials here, a two, a three, a seven, just like we just did. And it automatically totals it and averages it on my left. So you can see where we are by category. One of the nice things about this, for those who are gonna take the full workshop, is you can have this for free. You just copy this with all its formulas in it, get rid of the data inside it, and guess what? Use it with your own group. With Google Sheets, just like in Excel, you can do bar, see? Look at the bar graphs, they're the same as you were doing before. And what we're doing here is, guess what? This is what the rating was for this. And which I just you know, sorted it some high to low. Seven for supporting and capacity building, affecting communities with TB, survivors, policy advocacy, we're doing pretty good at six. But then these other ones, we weren't doing so well. Publishing the first round on stigma assessment. Um, our, our reports could be better. See, sensitizing paralegals and others. We could do better. And we knew it right away once we did this. Because visually, it's just so powerful. We had an engaging dialogue. This was really cool. We really got into it uh, using just Zoom. You can see me off on the right-hand corner. They have me on a screen, a big screen on the right over here. Uh, but otherwise, we're just using regular screens on our computers, wherever we are. But look at this. The level of engagement was uh, high considering the topic, training TB tuberculosis survivors on rights-based approaches. One individual stated that this activity would be a game changer for the TB eradication program in India. Mostly it was trying to get these folks who have had tuberculosis, survived, help them become advocates so that they can help fight the stigmatization going on in the healthcare system against folks who have tuberculosis. That's just one of our many kinds of uh, activities that we're engaged in to try to turn this around. But it's no different than being face-to-face. -face. You see how powerful this is just using Google Sheets and Zoom? Planning for the future, same thing. It's just us in Google uh, and Zoom, planning for the future, come up with the same kind of goals. See, goals to improve our training, our frontline training. Uh, so we have you know, better quality of service. Talked about evidence. 
we have, guess what? Not a shock. We have our evaluation dashboards online using Google Sheets. In this case, uh, we have pretty serious goals. We didn't quite make them. Guess what? We're learning from each other and we get better and better by making mistakes. We're in the second quarter when we have 30 of these things done, uh, these training programs, and we want to have 100. Well, we had to learn and learn from each other how to beef that up and really bring it to scale. And we did pretty good, 180 out of 200. We didn't do perfect, but by not stigmatizing and, and basically destroying each other, but instead of helping each other, we approximated our goals and almost achieved them perfectly. And once again, most folks even now don't read all of our reports, but everybody looks at a bar chart and they can check their own bar chart out without me even being there to see, oh, we're close. Okay, David, what do we need to do? Do you think, what would you recommend? Or do you know anyone we should talk to? Yeah, I've got some ideas. I've worked on this for a while. How about checking with these folks? And sure enough, boom, you're closer to where they, they were uh, earlier. We don't all have the answers, but we can help each other is the point. And it, it works if you're, look, if you were making a software, you're gonna wait until the end, until you think everyone's okay with it? No, you, it's all beta. All the thing we're using is beta. You know, all of Microsoft, everything else, it's beta. We're giving feedback all the time on how it should be improved. That's what this process is. While we're doing this, we're creating a ripple effect. Groups we didn't never, never even heard of before. Leapfrog to value. Touched by TB is kind of a cute one. They're now interested in what we're doing because they've heard of the energy and the effect that we're having. So you can have a ripple effect when you're moving forward with this. Next steps, training people in the field, using evaluation dashboards to monitor progress on a quarterly basis. The key is when you're in your third quarter, you're trying to close the gap between the actual performance and your annual goals. I'll end this part of the presentation by highlighting, and this is my family that we brought to uh, Mount Everest Space Camp about two or three years ago. Uh, trust me, we never thought we could accomplish this thing. But the point is, as in this, in an empowerment evaluation, if you make, you make your goals out, you can usually exceed them and your aspirations. You would be surprised when you give people the power and to, to move forward with their own goals in their life within the context of what they're being held accountable for in a contract. It's not you just do whatever you want, but within that context, you can help people reach their goals and way exceed their aspirations because they have a sense of ownership in the process. For those of you who want to know a lot more detail than we could cover today, um, these are some of the books. The ones if you wanna know about the $15 million race towards social justice with Hewlett Packard, uh, Bridging the Communities of Color, I mean, bridges, bridging the digital divide in this one, sorry. Uh, this one is the empowerment evaluation in the digital villages. The ones for you want to make changes in communities of color with tobacco prevention, look at this one, empowerment evaluation, and it has beautiful examples of uh, what I've been talking about today uh, that are up to date. And it combines the theory, the concepts, the steps, and the examples because people want us to put it all in one package instead of going from book to book to book. So that's your best package. And these are for the principles when you wanna know more about in depth, the principles on how to operate, understanding that you don't have to do it perfectly. We show examples of high levels of empowerment evaluation, medium and low levels. And you know what? They're all good. It depends on the context and capacity of the situation. If you wanna know more about some of the radio interviews that we've had for folks that seem to be interested a lot in what we're doing, we have them listed up here on our webpage as well. Once again, our latest book shows the differences so you can get a better feel for which is the one that you want the most or how you wanna combine them. Uh, we have, uh, I think uh, Mary mentioned earlier, she saw a lot of things on our webpage and uh, we try to collect as much as we can. We scour it for thousands of uh, documents uh, a year and we pick things that we think are free and or useful you know, or moderately priced, put them on there for folks to link up to. And then when they get to be outrageously priced, we move those off and find other things. So we're, it's a constant process uh, of trying to find things to help everyone. Uh, as I say, we did the best we could to cover as much as we can in a short period of time together. For those who want more, much more depth and a chance to actually get on to Google Sheets and work together, we're gonna hold one on April 14th, 2022. 
and just email me fettermanassociates at gmail.com or check on my webpage and you can see how to join the workshops for that. Uh, so we can go much more in depth uh, than we can do in a, in a seminar. So I hope that's helpful. I'm gonna switch in a second to just uh, question and answer. Uh, since we have, uh, I want to just create a little extra time so it'll be okay. Um, those who are interested also in ethnography, because when we do empowerment evaluation, sometimes we do a lot of qualitative descriptive work, not just quantitative, we do a combination. Uh, this is one of the books uh, that I also am special, I specialize in, um, in ethnography and, and how to make it systematic and credible. So let me end there if I could, and we'll start opening up to, uh, to um, questions. So let me just cancel over there, stop this, and then we can open up to, to you. Thanks for hanging in there, by the way, everyone. I know that was a lot all at once, and I know I go fast. So thanks for bearing with me. But let's open up to some questions. Uh, Rima, if you could just read some of them, that'd be great. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, David. Um, there, was a, there was a lot of brilliant information in the package. Um, a question, first question from Sonia. As a funding agency for health services, how do we incorporate empowerment evaluation into the service specifications of our contracts? Oh, yeah, very, very easily, actually. I do that a lot. I work with a lot of funders all the time, and they love it because, um, in fact, I'm working, I didn't mention, with Feeding America also. We're using this to help uh, grantees that, for money that we got from Starbucks to self-assess, to use monitor, to use uh, empowerment evaluation. And the, the, what we presented is the simplest way. It's not the only way. There are 10 steps to doing empowerment evaluation. There's a three-step. There's a number of different ones. This one's particularly straightforward and transparent and simple. Very easy to provide training on how to do this uh, within a few hours. And people get a feel for actually hands-on, like the one I'm gonna have on April 14th, is a little more hands-on and literally doing the Google Sheets together. Uh, you go bring them through the key steps and they have a handle on uh, how to self-assess. What you do is you simply outline what have you agreed to do for the money, because you don't just walk away from that and do anything. Within that context, what are the goals that they have in mind to accomplish for each of these things? What are their idea of the best strategies? And together, you sit in there as a funder and say whether you think that's credible enough for those um, for the evidence. And assuming it all makes sense, you move forward and we, you monitor uh, basically their performance and they monitor their own performance as well. Um, keep in mind, one of my concerns, as long as you ask this question from a funding perspective, is that I think that we are all messed up. And here's what I mean by that. I think evaluators learn, have to learn to let go a little bit more in general, all of us, me too, because uh, we're all kind of control freaks in our own different way, let go a little bit more than we want to. We have to rethink our funders. When we think of funders, we say, leave the money and walk away, you know, don't bother us. And we're missing the boat. Instead of using them for the resource that they are, it's not just that money, they are investing a whole bunch of different cool things. We should be asking them what does seems to be working from what you're learning. And we're not doing that. And the folks we work with at first embrace a lot of the empowerment evaluation and want to take, but the moment it gets tough and there's a financial thing going on or a pressure deadline or, you know, or they're being reviewed, think, oh, David, you're the evaluator. Why don't you? No, we will do it. So we've all been socialized, I think, the wrong way, all of us. So when you bring up the funding part, that's just one component where it's easy to infuse it as a tool to help them assess their own performance within the context of what they've held, been held accountable using, in this case, a three-step. But aside from answering that question, there's the larger question of remembering that we've all been socialized in compartments instead of working together to reinforce the learning and the accountability, but not let go of it just because it initially makes sense we all backtrack because it's easier. We get scared. We have to stay in the game. Sorry, sorry to go on a little bit more detail, but it's a very important question. Um, thank you. The second question is by Erin. How do you use this approach when the organization has a pre-existing program logic or monitoring data um, yeah, it, that they, that they want it. to work with? Do you yeah, it, it, it can work together. It works together with existing systems. You don't have to throw out the system that is there. You simply make it better, a higher quality by having one that also works and gets at the insider's view of reality. That's what ethnography helps. It helps to get at the insider's perspective because you can have this great elaborate assessment and it, be, it should keep it. 
But if you want to make it more refined and more precise, you need to constantly be getting the insider's perspective, the community's view, et cetera. Otherwise, it's going to be perfect, but off center and not useful at the end. That is what helps keep it grounded. So you can you sim it's not having two parallel. It's having two working together, integrating each other. The empowerment one can be informed by some of these other issues and these statistics that are being gathered to give us sort of a feel for where things are going, whether the needle's moving or not. But it can't go anywhere if it's not grounded in what the community knowledge is about how things are gonna fly, how they're gonna be perceived. So I, I routinely run into a programs where they don't, they already have an existing system. The problem is it's either not respected, not valued, uh, it's considered just an accountability thing. So they're looking for something meaningful to move the needle, to change what's broken. And this becomes the wind of opportunity to get their view and their ownership in the process. And more and more funders in the States in particular are recognizing that. And that's why they're asking for empowerment evaluation so much. Mm. Um, there are a few questions on data. Um, I'm gonna combine two together. Jeff asks, um, what data, which numbers and whose evidence and whose stories, what language, etc., cetera, do, do you use? And Keisha asks, how do you overcome group think uh, when you use tools such as um, Google Sheets? So yep. they are related to data. This is gonna throw you, but I like some parts of group think. It's like, oh no, that's the wrong answer. Let me explain. Yes, you do have checks on, on, on groupthink because you invite people who most of us are told to leave behind. I'm always, when I go to an organization, I'm always told, leave so-and-so out because they're a pain in the neck. They always have something you know extreme to say. And I say, no, no, I want them because they'll say something outrageous like the director's corrupt or who knows what. So then talking about staffing, which was you know too dangerous to talk about, it becomes nothing. So that's one of the reasons I always invite and have as inclusive as possible for the types of folks that are out there, including folks who are somewhat antagonistic. And those people in particular, if you don't invite, they'll undermine you anyway. So you better keep them close and get their views, et cetera. But I know what you, I know the, what you mean by the group think, the negative part of it. And that's why I have multiple perspectives. I don't have, I make sure I was inclusive as possible about different levels in the organization that are all brought to bear. That's why it needs to be as inclusive as possible. That's where you get these different vantage points where people can't just automatically go and you've only got one group that's represented and of course you'll get group think out of it. Now, here's the positive spin of group thing again that will sound incorrect or wrong. That is fantastic. When I do say the dots in taking stock, I want you to know that the group is thinking this is more important than this one that you're picking. I want them to go with the energy is in the room. Why waste it? If that's where most of the energy is for the group, then they probably have a consensus that this is what needs to be dealt with at this time. As an outlier, you're not gonna have as much of a dose effect from a medical perspective. If you're out doing this and you're doing this and you're this, but you see the group is really thinking this is the most important. Well, you know what? Maybe they know what they're talking about. Let's work at that as a focal point that's where I do like group think. I don't like it when it cuts out divergent thinking. And that's why I make it as inclusive as possible with various different viewpoints and different roles. Like when I work in East Palo Alto, I have folks from, that have uh, Pacific Islanders, African-Americans, uh, uh, Latinx, um, uh, Black Americans that said, um, all coming together. And everyone said, David, you're gonna fail there, right? And I said, no, I don't, I, you know, I don't think so. I said, how many of us care about what we need to do to improve education for our kids in the community? Didn't matter what your background was, your hand went up. Common denominators. I asked the same thing about security. It's a pretty dangerous place. Hands went up. Housing. We couldn't get agreement. So we didn't work on that. You can't work on everything. But the point is you get diverse viewpoints that have common denominators. The secret of empowerment evaluation, I'm glad you asked this question, is going to sound weird. Um, it's self-interest. You're going, whoa, that sounds terrible. No, it's mutual self-interest. In other words, you're trying to find the common denominators across the board of everyone's self-interest. If you're interested in helping to improve education for the kids in your community, that's your bias, that's your self-interest. I want to hear that. 
And then Mary Kay's got the same concern, okay? Libby's got the same concern. Maddie doesn't, okay, fine. We've got a core of folks who are interested in this of self-interest. If the people were upset with us so that we didn't include housing in that, in that project that we did, they were mad. I said, did you come to the table? Did you come to any of the socials that we created? We have, I bend over backwards, have socials, barbecue, you know, whatever. I go to the churches at first. After a certain point, you know what? You've heard about what we're doing. You're not coming. It's not my problem. Self-interest. You want to be us to take part of what you're doing seriously and move forward with it? You got to be present. Show your self-interest. We can find a common denominator with that self-interest. We'll move forward. So I know it sounds weird, but that's why this works. You find out what's the self-interest. You're not ashamed of it. You're not embarrassed. What is it? Put it on the table. If we can find a common thread of self-interest, we have a combined one. We'll work on that. Cool. Kind of strange though, I know, but I'm just honest. This is this is how the game really works. Cool, David. Um, I got um, two questions related to ethics and anonymity. So Louis asks, how do you deal with institutional ethics review committees who usually want to know exactly what you will ask before you start? Um, and we have Kat asking, does, um, does the fact that the baseline data gathering exercise is not anonymous affect the results? Um, there could be um, some political um, worries about rocking the boat with the boss, et cetera. Yeah. That's why I always have big groups. I'm not unaware of Machiavellian politics. So I always like to have large size groups so that's hard for somebody's senior position to come down on someone in a more junior position in front of everyone and they're more accountable. That's why I don't have this with only two people or only mm -hmm. three people. I have it with large groups. It's in front of the whole group. Now, having said that, once again, this is gonna sound strange, but People say to me, David, why don't you send the director out so we can do this ourselves? And I go, no, I do not want that. That turns into a whining session. I wanna know what are you willing to say within the context of what you have to live with? Otherwise I'm setting you up for failure and I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna let you say whatever you want and then suddenly you can't do it because you now have the director there. If you're in a situation where you can't say everything you want, guess what? That's just the reality of the limitation of how far you can go with empowerment in your context. High, medium, low levels. It'd be great if you have perfect levels of it and everyone's open. I work best in groups that are philosophically already oriented towards being more open, trying to build, not being too defensive, we all are defensive, but not too, about critiquing each other in a diplomatic way. I can go much faster. So I work with groups like that more. I've worked with authoritarian hierarchical ones, and you can work and do empowerment by wish, but you get less and less accomplished compared to groups that are already philosophically oriented that way. Now you could argue the group that is authoritarian, hierarchical, need it more. Fine. I just per make a personal choice not to spend as much time with that group because I can go so much further. That's a personal choice. Uh, Joyce Keller, in our earliest book on empowerment evaluation, worked with the Tox Texas uh, Audit Agency. Impossible to work with, hierarchical authority, and she did it. But you have to choose for yourself, so it's possible, but you have to choose for yourself as an evaluator, where do you want to spend your time, given how much time we all have on Earth? Uh, can you go further with a group that understands the philosophy, not necessarily the tools and techniques, that's what you're there for to help them, but they understand the orientation towards helping people help themselves. So that's, that's more of a personal choice. So the Machiavellian part, um, um, uh, aware of the, the confidentiality thing, the IRB part, if you, you can specify in IRB that you'll be asking these kinds of questions. The same way I know I have a photo op at mission, I have a photo op at taking stock, I have a photo op at playing with you. I don't know what they're gonna say. I have no idea, but I know I have a photo op that I can use for documentation. The same way I know I have key questions I can ask in mission. I have no, I have key questions in taking stock. I have key questions in play. I know exactly what they are. I don't know what the answer is going to be. And if you did, you wouldn't be doing research. Mm -hmm. So you can specify what those are for IRB with no problem. IRB, this has been passed through IRB many for many, many times. Let me add one more thing about the ethics issue, um, about the anonymity. In traditional forms of evaluation, you want it to be confidential. You know, don't mention your name because, you know, people don't show honest if, they're, if they're, um, they don't have their name on it. You know, for empowerment evaluation, Tough luck, baloney, that's garbage. 
I want to, it, that's like having an evaluation where you're just using, you know, um, an anonymous kind of uh, Facebook or something where people just say what they want and they're very disingenuous or put on, you know, their best performance of who they are. I need to know who you are and why you think what you think. And I need you to understand what I think and where I'm coming from. So it's not about being confident. I made all the mistakes, trust me. I've made, I don't have time to tell you all of them, but I'll tell you as many as I can remember of the mistakes I've made. I used to have it where everyone goes behind the board and then puts their ratings there. Well, then how do you ask who knows what, right? I wanna know what you think and you need to let the group know what you think. And you say what you can within the context of what you feel safe enough. It's not perfect world, but safe enough to communicate and you work within that context so that you can move forward. So that when we're done with this session, you can still speak what your mind was about that within that context, because you said what you're willing to say within context of that director being there. Now, what happens a lot of times is the director will also learn to be quiet and see, oh my gosh, I shouldn't dominate, take over this thing uh, because I'm actually learning with things I didn't even know. And I'm still holding you accountable for what you said you would do. You see what I mean? Because you're coming up with a strategy, but it's still the same goals. So there's still not, people were afraid of empowerment evaluation in the early days because they think, oh, I'm going to lose my job as a supervisor. Just, no, you're still a supervisor, but you're just holding people accountable for the things they said they would do to get to that same goal. So once they got past that, it became more workable. It's, but you do have large groups on purpose with different levels, because I am aware of Machiavellian politics, but within that context, you can accomplish a tremendous amount. I'm just very realistic at the same time. So I hope that's helpful. Um, that's great. Um, the final question is about the timing to do evaluation in a COVID context. So Libby works um, in a community organization and currently uh, people, frontline workers and managers are under stress um, and with, with limited bandwidth for evaluation. And she wants to know um, if you would recommend that um, it's postponed until things settle down when people have the energy to participate? No. No? Okay. No, no, do not, do not. <laughs> this is the window of opportunity. This is, um, I, I work with a lot of groups and they're constantly have the excuse of, you know, it's COVID and uh, so maybe we should slow down and, you know, um, you know what? I have people, I'm not kidding you, dying right now that I work with and we are sticking together and doing the best we can, particularly in India right now, because we see there's a larger picture that we have, we have to accomplish. We can't constantly just say, this is in our way. This is our... If it wasn't COVID, it was politics before that. If it wasn't that, it was uh, stigmatization that was uh, outrageous for TB folks uh, by the hospitals. There's always something gigantic. You have to keep your eye on the prize. There is no perfect time. There's always a mess out there. That's the whole point. That's why we're dealing with so many social justice issues. Too many people have let the burden get in the way, let the obstacles get in the way. Our job is to take advantage of, I mean, let me put it this way. People get upset with me when I argue that we should be doing more in professional organizations because then you know, we have COVID, we can't meet. So we have to limit the number of presentations. That is garbage to me, garbage, noise to my system. To me, this is an opportunity. I, I, COVID is terrible. We all have to worry about the dangers of dealing with folks and folks we love dealing with, but it's also an opportunity to use this Zoom to do what we're doing right now. Because of COVID, we are able to communicate, all of us together right now. And that's what we should do. We should seize terrible circumstances and turn them around to our advantage to help others help others. This to me is what we're, too many people are missing the goal. So sorry to be too strong about this, but I'm very concerned that this is our moment very much to take this window of opportunity to reach out and help people help themselves on an exponential scale. I created a virtual conference going along with AEA at the same time as AEA that anybody can join if they just get through the review system that we review not because we only have two sessions or three sessions available left in the program. Yours meets it, we put it on there. It doesn't cost anything. We use Google uh, Sites for free to put up the program. To me, it's our problem in evaluation is the limitation of our own creativity. Our, we have to expand the opportunity and help others reach out 
especially when we have calamities that are worldwide that are bringing us all together like they are today. COVID, even though we're in Omicron, we st this is still a massive, we don't know what new variants are coming, but we can use this to get closer to each other. And that's what we're doing. So sorry, once again, to be so strong about it. To me, this is a window of opportunity. Um, David, thank you so much. Even though we have just come to 1.30 and it's closing time, I'd like to sneak in one more question from me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'd like to go back to that gap analysis slide that you um, originally inserted. And have you ever written an evaluation um, where you have to account for multiple th truths, where different stakeholders feel that the gap between the intended practice and the actual is so diverse or not so diverse? And if so, did you have to go through any conflict resolution process or if not, did you just openly explain to the stakeholders that I need to account for variation? How, how did you go about that? Thanks for asking that question. I owe you $5. One of, the, one of the things we do, which is fun, you've just hit on a beautiful thing. When we do, for example, taking stock and we put in our ratings, right? We have all of our initials and put our ratings. We'll leave it up there for a while because we'll say it's been an hour on mission, two or three hours on taking stock. Then the next day we'll do plans for the future. It doesn't have to take our, you know, days and days of data to do all this stuff. But when we're looking at taking stock and the ratings, if someone doesn't mention it, I might mention, look at that. All of the administrators seem to have very high ratings and they'll usually see it themselves, the pattern. And those of us on the staff level have much lower ratings for this thing because we're more critical. We see what's going on. To your point, they can see in the data that we have totally different views about the same issues. And that's when you have it. That's when you've got the game, when they are enmeshed in the data themselves and they can see, and they can then disaggregate the data and say, okay, let's compare this. We have a problem, we have a question. And then we have a challenge and the opportunity for real meaningful dialogue and discussion from divergent points of view. And typically those on the staff are much more critical. People say, oh, empowerment, gonna get all positive self-assessment. No, this is a chance for people to have a broken situation in their work to fix it, to do something. They don't wanna go into work every day with the same thing broken. And if you're on the more ground level, you're gonna be even more critical because you're the one that can see what's broken and have to deal with it every day. And then you can, and they're usually the more critical folks for the ratings than those that are at the more senior level in comparison. That's just one example of when that gap occurs. And yes, you can have a conflict resolution, you have a dialogue, but you have data and evidence to base it on. And people can then see it's because of their different roles sometimes. The Dean saw, we did wonderful from his perspective compared to the larger institute, we weren't thinking external versus internal communication. You, the, it becomes illuminating to get into that exact dialogue. So it's not a negative to have that gap. That's the wonderful part of empowerment evaluation is to engage and face and interact with that gap. That's where the light goes on. That's where the elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about, sexism, racism, ageism emerges, but it's contained because you don't let it just spiral out of control. It then is it contained and then you move on to plans for the future. So. Anyway, wonderful question, wonderful question. Thank you so much, David. Um, everyone, I have saved the chat and I know some of you want um, references to the articles. I will follow up on that. Uh, and um, David's email, um, I will send email, I will send you a, a copy of the chat as well. Um, about a week from today, I'd like to thank David for your time and the fantastic presentation. We learned so much today. Thank you everyone for joining in and for your brilliant questions. It really enriched um, today's seminar. So thank you so much.